I want to introduce Meg Madden. She is an artist, photographer, naturalist, hiker, and mushroom lover from Middlebury, Vermont. Her interest in mushrooms was initially piqued during the lockdown when she and her daughter went for walks in the woods. Our fascination during that time, my daughter and I, was Jack in the Pulpits. <laughs> um, uncounted photos later, her book, this book is for people who love mushrooms, is a compendium of nature's weirdest and most wonderful fungi with profiles of notable mushrooms and information on foraging, understanding, and appreciating these magnificent living things. In fact, Meg is going to be leading a mushroom walk today um, at three o'clock and to meet at the Bookstock Information Tent. Meg has been recognized by the Green Mountain and Finger Lakes Division of the National Forest Service for her contributions in documenting mycological diversity during a year-long local bio blitz, which I hope we'll learn a little bit more about. And without further ado, please help me welcome Meg Madden. All right, can everybody hear me? Great, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm uh, really happy to sort of expand my um, audience. I live in Middlebury, Vermont, and I do a lot of um, talks and walks in that area. I have been expanding my range, and I'm doing about so far 40 walks and talks, forays, and bio blitzes around the state this year, ranging from as far north as the Montpelier area to as far south as the um, White River Junction area. I do a lot of programming through nature organizations, conservation organizations, Audubon Vermont, Birds of Vermont, um, North Branch Nature Center, Shelburne Farms Educational Center, et cetera. Um, I have always been fascinated by mushrooms. I grew up in nature. Um, I was one of those kids that spent more time in nature than in front of the television. I would get home from school and bolt off the school bus, go in and get a snack and run into the woods to see what I could find. Um, mushrooms have always been sort of on my periphery, but during the pandemic, they really caught my attention. I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time in the woods, and from March through that entire year, I was able to watch the, the woods wake up day by day. And um, I have a very scientific brain, and I need to know everything I can about whatever I'm interested in, so I dove down the mycological rabbit hole, and here I am today. Um, and uh, one book later, and working on another one. The book is available at the Yankee Bookshop tent on the green. I'll be signing books at 12.30 if anyone is interested. But um, let's look at some mushrooms. These are all Vermont mushrooms. They're all taken from about an hour from where I live, if you figure a radius around Middlebury. Um, I just have to figure out what direction this goes in. Yeah, so here I am in my element with the things I love the most, uh, mushrooms. And I like to talk about how a lot of people have sort of a preconceived notion of what a mushroom looks like. Tan, cap, and stem. The one on the right I like to call the emoji mushroom. Everyone knows that from popular culture, storybooks. Um, these are the images of mushrooms that we most often see, especially in America. But mushrooms come in every color. And again, these are not exotic. These are all found in Vermont. They come in every shape, not just traditional mushroom shaped. We have mushrooms that look like coral and shells and sea life, brains. Some are very, very tiny. All the mushrooms in these photos have my hand or fingers in it for scale. And believe me, I'm digging through the leaf litter on my, on my hands and knees, laying on the ground, finding these things and taking photos of them. I have a special attachment. These are all iPhone photographs, by the way. Um, I have an iPhone 11 and I have a clip. So this is actually a, an add-on lens that enables me to take macro photos, so very, very close-up photos of very tiny subject matter. 
if anyone's interested in that, you can approach me later on, and I'm happy to give you the information about that. And some mushrooms are very large. So um, let me see if I can get this to go. So this mushroom right here, a lot of people are familiar with that one. That's the giant puffball. Um, it's an edible. It shows up in the fall. It looks like someone has kicked a volleyball into your yard. Um, some of the other ones are a little lesser known, but yeah, so there are some very large mushrooms out as well. And then as far as cap shape, there are some that are shaped like flowers, some that are very fuzzy, scaly, sticky, stem shapes come in lots and lots of colors and different shapes. I think the one on the right looks a lot like a mushroom out of Disney's Fantasia. Different scales and textures. And then the other part of the mushroom that we think about is the underside. So if you flip a portobello mushroom over that you find in the supermarket, you'll see that it has gills. And a lot of people are familiar with that structure. And the gills are there to enable the mushroom to produce and distribute spores so that they can start colonies elsewhere. The mushroom is actually part of a larger organism. So when we talk about a mushroom, we're actually talking about essentially the fruit of a fungus. And the fungus is the part that we don't really see. It's largely under the soil, in wood, in the leaves. Um, and then when it's time to reproduce, they produce mushrooms, and the mushrooms produce spores. So the gills are folded like that in order to increase the surface area by which they have the ability to produce those spores. If it was just flat, they wouldn't have as much real estate for that function. Or a couple of different other gill structures. This, by the way, is my favorite viewpoint of a mushroom. A lot of people are looking at mushrooms from, you know, however tall they are, five foot five, six foot, and they're looking at the top, but the underside is really pretty spectacular. And then some mushrooms have different ways of producing spores besides gills. So these are pores, um, which are tiny holes, which are attached to a tube, which goes up inside the flesh of the mushroom, and that's where the spores are being produced. And then some mushrooms have um, teeth or spines, spiny projections. Again, that's increasing the surface area by which the mushroom can produce spores. And then some mushrooms have fancy parts. So the one on the left has something that's called a skirt or an annulus or um, a partial veil. And if you can imagine that skirt tucked up underneath the base of the mushroom, that's where it first started out. And the function of that um, tissue is to protect the mushroom's gills from being eaten before the mushroom can produce spores. And then the mushroom on the right has the same kind of, it's called a, a partial veil, but it's made up out of these cobwebby fibers, um, giving it the common name of web cap. And it has the same function, it's protecting the mushroom's gills. Some sweat, the one on the left, is not covered in raindrops. Those drops are actually coming from inside the mushroom. When certain mushrooms are young and they're first growing and there's a lot of humidity, they actually push uh, moisture out of their flesh. It's called gutation. And the mushroom on the right is producing something called um, latex or milk. There's a whole family of mushrooms called milk caps. And if the cap or stem is damaged, it, it leaks out these um, milky drops. They're various colors depending on the species of mushroom. And the function of the drops is to gum up the mouth parts of anything that would try to eat it. So um, I found an unfortunate slug one day trying to eat uh, a milk cap, and it wasn't having much luck because it didn't like it. And I immediately moved it over to a puff ball, and it started munching down. So I got to see that actually functioning in nature. And then we have mushrooms that don't even look like our preconceived notion of a mushroom. Um, frilly, brainy. The orange peel fungus on the right, I have 
so many times come across something that I thought was this mushroom, and it was a clementine peel that a hiker had discarded. And mushrooms that look like sea life, so sea urchins and starfish, and even coral. We have a lot of coral species of mushrooms in Vermont, and they come in every color from white to yellow, orange, um, tan, and brown, and also this really beautiful purple color. So I was talking earlier about how the mushroom is really the visible reproductive structure that we generally see, and that there's this whole underground um, system that we typically don't see unless we disturb the ground or we move the leaves over or we dig through a log. And it's made up of this mycelium. And the mycelium is threads of fungal tissue that um, allow the mushroom to travel and also absorb nutrients. So they're full of enzymes and uh, one of the primary tasks of one group of fungi is to decompose things. So it could be leaves, it could be wood, it could be um, animals. There are a couple of mushrooms that actually decompose wood, um, bone rather. So that's what this mycelium is doing. But mycelium does other things too. Mycelium can also connect trees. Uh, there's a book called Finding the Mother Tree and it's about one scientist's discoveries about um, what has been deemed the wood wide web. So basically, if you can imagine the internet for the natural world, uh, this mycelium is actually connecting trees within an ecosystem so that they can communicate and share water and nutrient with one another. The fungi that do that are called mycorrhizal fungi. They're not decomposing things. They're actually getting their nutrients from the plants that they're connected to. Um, mushrooms, fungus, they have no way of making their own food. They're not like plants. They don't photosynthesize. They don't have chlorophyll. So some have figured out the system of connecting with plants so they trade greater access to water and nutrients via their network with the plant for sugars that the plants are making through photosynthesis. This is my gateway mushroom. This is what made me fall in love with mushrooms. I have photos of mushrooms from years past. Um, I have posters of mushrooms in my house. I've always been intrigued with them. But this was the mushroom that made me um, go head over heels for them. My daughter and I discovered these in March of 2020. And I could not believe that there was nothing. There were no plants. There were no shoots. Nothing was alive. And these things were out in full force. This is the scarlet elf cup. It's um, an ascomycetes. So the spores are actually made on the surface, on the red part of the mushroom. And sometimes when you find these, if you blow on one, they'll release spores, um, which is kind of a fun, a fun thing. Maybe we'll find some on the walk later. Not this species, because these are really specific to early spring. But yeah, I just I couldn't believe it. And I had to know everything I could possibly find out about mushrooms after this. Um, I want to talk about uh, one of our biggest groupings of mushrooms. It's the, one of the largest genuses of mushrooms that we have in the United States and actually in the world. There are about 200 species um, in the United States. And they have some of those fancy parts I was talking about earlier. They have the skirt. You can see that right there. And that used to be up against the bottom side of the mushroom gills. But they also have this very specialized part right here, and that is called the universal veil. You can see on the left that these mushrooms are emerging from that veil, and that is what is protecting that mushroom before it emerges, and that's a fully formed um, amanita on the left, or the right rather. The one on the right I actually found in Woodstock. There's a place called the Eshquabog, and um, I photographed that mushroom two years ago there. There's another view of that uh, universal veil. It's also called an egg or um, a, a vulva. And again, there's the emoji mushroom. In the eastern United States, we don't have the classic red and white amanita. We have this variety, the yellow version. 
which ranges in, from yellow to sort of that peachy color and a little bit of a um, dark orange red. The dots on the cap of that mushroom originated from this veil. So when this mushroom emerges from this veil, tiny bits of it stick to the cap, and when the cap expands, that's what makes those dots. This is the deadliest mushroom that we have in the northeastern United States. I always ask people, you know, based on the name, do you think this is edible? <laughs> um, it is not, and um, it looks a lot like some other species of mushroom. It's white, it has a cap and stem. It does have this veil, but there's another species that does as well. Amanitas generally come out of that egg that I was talking about, that universal veil. So sometimes when you're trying to identify a mushroom, it's really important to do a little dig around the base of the mushroom and see if you can find that veil. About a quarter of that mushroom, if you ate that, you, there's no coming back from it. It has toxins in it, which break down your liver. So unless you get a liver transplant, you're pretty much done. So here's a comparison. The one on the left is the destroying angel. You can see the cap, the stem, the veil. The mushroom on the right is actually edible, and it looks very much like the one on the left. These are black trumpet mushrooms. I usually find these when I'm looking at other mushrooms. They look like the shadows, they look like leaves, they look like um, a lot of things that blend in. So typically I'm bending down and looking at this bright red mushroom right here and I realize that there are black trumpets bl blooming next to it. And I tell people, if you find a black trumpet, hold really still, don't walk around because chances are there are a lot of them around you. And <clears throat> I call it getting your mushroom eyes, sort of like, tuning your brain into a pattern recognition. So um, looking at it and then looking carefully, and it, it happens with morels too. Morels look a lot like pine cones and shadows and leaves. This is the bear's head tooth. Some people are probably familiar with lion's mane mushrooms. They've become pretty readily available at farmer's markets and in specialty um, food shops. This is our native version of it. It's in the same genus. Um, these break down hardwood, typically maple and beech, and they're found in the fall. And the teeth, the icicle-like projections on those mushrooms are where the spores are being produced. And this is uh, a delicious edible and really something that you can't confuse with anything else. It's very distinctive. And it's relative, the coral tooth, it's the same genus, but a different species. And you can see that it just has kind of a frillier um, shape to it. This is a wood bluet. Uh, these come out in the fall. You can see on the left, there are big tooth aspen leaves with it. The interesting thing about this mushroom is that it, um, it decomposes leaves. So you typically find them growing in deep piles of leaf litter. But if they run out of nutrients in those leaves, they will invade nearby soil bacteria colonies and eat the soil bacteria. Also, uh, I would think they would smell like grape, but they smell like oranges. <laughs> Bird's nest fungus. Um, these fungi have a very particular way of reproducing. The things that look like tiny eggs are actually called peridials, and they contain the fungus's spores. And the way they're distributed is that raindrops fall in the cups, and they splash out, taking those eggs with them, and they sort of splash into the nearby woods, stick to something else, and start a new colony. Um, so they've developed this very specific way of distributing, the, distributing themselves. Some of the coral fungus we saw earlier, this is kind of a pinky orange version. And a couple of species of yellow. I just call these tiny campfires. They're only about an inch tall. And I, this has got to be my favorite. I mean, purple mushrooms are so rare and I just absolutely love the form of it. This is a good example of why it's important to look at the top and the bottom of a mushroom both. 
This is the same mushroom. The view on the left is the top. Pretty plain looking. If you flip it over, you've got this incredible gill structure underneath. And there are a lot of mushrooms that look like the one on the left. Turkey tails, um, a lot of the little shelf fungi that grow on logs look a lot like this, but a lot of them have a very distinctive underside. Has anyone seen The Last of Us or heard of The Last of Us? A uh, popular show on Netflix right now based on a video game. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's about zombie fungi. So basically a strain of fungus that's infecting humans and turning them into zombies. Thankfully, it can't actually happen in real life. Um, we have great immune systems and our uh, physiology doesn't really allow for colonization of fungi in our bodies, at least not um, brain controlling fungi. Um, but they do parasitize insects quite often. And these are two moth pupa. So this is the pupa of a moth, and this is the pupa of a moth. And these are two species that attack, parasitize, digest the pupa, and then produce this mushroom out of the top of the pupa. And then the spores are produced here and here. Uh, there are parasitic fungi that attack ants. Um, they infect the ants with spores. If an ant that's infected with spores tries to enter the colony and it's caught by other ants, they will take that ant away, far, far away from the colony, destroy it, and then destroy themselves. Because if that fungus took over the colony, it would infect every single ant in the colony. If the ant doesn't if the ant goes undetected by the colony, the fungus takes complete control over the ant's body and it has no ability to control itself anymore. The fungus causes the ant to walk up a stem of a plant that's directly over the colony. Um, scientists have discovered that there's sort of an optimal height for where they stop um, and that height is where the spores are most um, effectively distributed, and then the ant clamps its jaws down on a leaf or a stem so that it can't fall off or blow away, and then the fungus produces a fruiting body out of the ant's head, and then spores rain down on the colony below, and that is how it goes. There's um, also a fungus that infects cicadas, and their cycle cycles with the cicadas, so there was a big emergence of cicadas in the south few years ago, I think, a couple of years ago. And there's, um, there's a cordyceps fungus that infects them, and it takes over the entire body of the cicada. It replaces its organs and its sexual organs with um, fungal tissue, so they literally cannot reproduce, but the fungus says, reproduce, reproduce. And so the cicadas go around trying to reproduce with one another and in so spreading spores. It's very effective. They're called the salt shakers of death. Now something a little more warm and fuzzy. Um, I call these the fuzzy leg warmer mushrooms. This is pretty rare. I've only ever seen this a couple of times. Uh, this is related to a morel. Morels are edible. These are not, but they're in the same family of mushrooms. They're making their spores up here on this really irregular looking cap. To me, they look like someone has poured cream and then it froze. This is in the same genus as enoki mushrooms. Enoki are the fine white mushrooms with the itty bitty little caps that you sometimes get in Asian restaurants or find in, in specialty food markets. They're um, almost identically the same mushroom. These are the natural version, and the way that cultivators get those long, thin mushrooms to grow is that they put them in cylinders so that they're confined, and they grow them in the dark and with uh, low oxygen. Fungi are actually more close, closely related to humans than they are plants. Uh, back on the evolutionary tree, um, we're closer related. So 
fungi actually need oxygen just like we do. So by depriving them of light and oxygen in space, they produce those long, thin mushrooms. I personally prefer these voluptuous mushrooms as nature intended. <laughs> They're edible, but they're slimy, so it's sort of a preferential thing. These are in the same family as the scarlet elf cups that we saw early on. Um, these have this really fun fringe of hair around the edges. I've researched and researched and researched, and I cannot figure out why they have these hairs, like what function it serves. It's not like um, a plant, like a pitcher plant or a... Venus flytrap, it's not trapping insects or anything. But they're really fun to find. A lot of folks are familiar with turkey tails. They're one of our more common mushrooms. They're actually very cosmopolitan. I think they're found worldwide. But they come in lots and lots of different colors. And the name Tremedes versicolor actually means many colors or multicolored. And it refers to the fact that it comes in all of these amazing colors. The green in the one on the left is algae. Sometimes if they persist for more than one year, algae will use them as a surface area for growing. The algae isn't benefiting them, it's not hurting them, it's just using them as a place to photosynthesize. And they even come in this really lovely blue color. And I seem to find the blue ones in specific places. Um, I don't know if it's something that's in the soil there that's aiding in the color choice. I said a little bit earlier that it's really important to look at the top and the bottom of a mushroom. So a lot of people mistake these for turkey tails. Oops. You can see the one on the right looks a lot like this mushroom on the left. But if you turn this over or look underneath, it has these gills on the underside, which is a little confusing because um, polypore means a poured mushroom, many pores which typically means tiny little holes, and here we have gills. And it's, it was thought to be a, an evolutionary thing where um, they sort of branched out and decided to produce gills instead, and it's since been discovered that they're really just elongated pores. This is the violet tooth polypore. Again, very turkey tail looking on the top, but if you flip it over, it's actually purple on the underside. And the, what I love about this photo on the left is that it looks like there's moss growing on the cap of this mushroom, and it's actually the mushroom itself. The mushroom is that texture and that color, but there's also moss in the photo. And this is one of my favorites. This, first of all, is my favorite color, and it's just a color you do not say, see in nature. Um, it's very, very uncommon. Some folks see the blue stained wood on the right more commonly than they see the mushrooms on the left. And those mushrooms are, each one of those individual mushrooms is only a few millimeters across. So that whole mushroom segment right there is probably an inch. The mushroom produces a pigment called xylandine, which is present in all parts of it, including the mycelium. So when the mycelium colonizes its wood, it's staining it that same blue color. Um, xylandine has been uh, a subject of study recently to see if it is color fast um, and stable as an alternative to more toxic uh, dyes in the textile industry. This is two different forms of the same mushroom. The form on the left is the sexual form. So it's producing spores on these little disks. And then on the one on the right, it's reproducing itself by just making more of itself. These are like confetti on the logs. These fruit in the fall. And you might see a log absolutely just covered with these. Each one of those dots on the left is anywhere from about a millimeter to two or three millimeters across. And these are out right now. So um, I typically find these when I'm looking for chanterelles. And if you don't dig through the leaf litter, you're not going to find these. These are fruiting on tiny little sticks that are half buried um, in the leaf litter and the soil. But if you were to clear away the leaf litter, you're likely to find these growing under 
hardwoods like um, maple and birch, beech, oak. The green-headed jelly baby is a fun one. Uh, it's also good ch called chicken lips. I'm not sure why, but that's the other common name for it. And I don't know if it's because they're as uncommon as lips on a chicken or um, if chickens had lips, someone imagined that they would look like this. I don't know. Uh, fun fact about these is that you can actually dehydrate these and boil them in simple syrup, coat them in um, citric acid, and make Sour Patch Kids out of them. So you can actually make gummy candies out of these. Lots of folks have seen these. These come up in the fall, usually after a rain, in a lawn. Um, they're doing this really fun thing called deliquescing. Deliquesce means to self-digest. So the spores of this mushroom are way up inside this cap, and there's a teeny tiny little opening down there which makes it virtually impossible for them to distribute spores on uh, air currents. So what they do is they melt themselves from the bottom up. You can see that this one's starting to do it here, and this one's very much in the process of doing it. So between uh, when they first appear in a lawn and they become a puddle of liquid can be as short as 24 hours, and the the black is from the spores that are in the mushroom. This is one of the most fragile and ephemeral mushrooms that we have, but it's also one of the strongest. So there are stories about this mushroom breaking through asphalt and pushing up paving stones. When a fungus makes a mushroom, it forces lots and lots of water into its tissues to form a mushroom and the sheer hydraulic pressure of that mushroom formation can actually break through pavement. Um, there was a story I read recently about a town in England that laid paving stones in the town uh, to build a road, and then the road became strangely irregular in the next few weeks, and then big mushrooms started pushing the stones up and displacing them. The heaviest stone that they found displaced was um, two feet by two feet and about 85 pounds. This is chicken of the woods. This is a polypore mushroom that grows on decaying woods. We have a few different species here. Um, I actually have two slides together. This is the jack-lantern mushroom. And I show these two together because this one is generally considered edible. There's about 20% of the population that just can't digest it very well. And this one will make you, it won't kill you, but it will make you pretty sick. Some people get these confused. Um, this mushroom is orange, and this mushroom is orange, and that's basically where the similarities end. This mushroom has pores on the underside, and this one has gills. There was a woman that posted a TikTok about how she fed her family uh, jack-lantern mushrooms and thought they were chicken of the woods. So um, it's very important what, if you're foraging to know exactly what you're uh, about to eat or feed your family. This is also bioluminescent. So this is one of a, uh, several species of fungi in the Northeast that produce their own light. I've huddled in the woods, <laughs> terrified in the night just to see this happen, and it's true, it really does. This is a milk cap mushroom. This is the indigo milk cap. You can see that it's producing this latex, but it's this really cool bright blue color. And this is actually edible, and another one that if you're beginning foraging um, is a good one to start with because it really cannot be um, misidentified. They grow under pine trees. They're micro mycorrhizal with pines. Um, this is another of our bioluminescent species. It produces so little light that um, it's really hard to see with our, our own eyes. But uh, if you cut the flesh of this mushroom, it bleeds red liquid, which is where it gets its common name. Oyster mushrooms, readily available in the store, but they also grow here in Vermont on hardwood logs and trees. 
We have three different species. One of them is the summer oyster and the fall oyster. They, they fruit at different times and on different substrates, so different kinds of wood. And this is uh, called the mock oyster because it has a similar shape and habitat. Not edible, but a really fun mushroom to find. Apparently, it's also called the stinking orange oyster because it can have um, kind of a disgusting smell to it, which I didn't smell for a couple of years, but I finally found a patch that smelled bad, and it smelled like rotting cabbage and spoiled eggs maybe mixed, and it took, a, <laughs> it took a really long time to get that particular smell out of my nose. This is a wood decomposer. It's related to the um, fuzzy leg warmer mushroom that we saw earlier, and another one in the same family. This is related to the giant puffball. These are much smaller. There's a size comparison photo here. So there's a giant puffball, that being about the size of a volleyball, and the, the common puffball is much, much smaller, but they also have these really beautiful um, surface structures that remind me of coral, maybe, something from under the sea. Also edible but it's important to harvest these when they're pure white all the way through. And if you were to find something that looks like a puffball and you wanted to eat it, cut it, cut into it, if there's something that looks like the shape of a mushroom inside it, you have an Amanita egg, definitely do not eat it. These are related to puffballs. They're in the same family. Puffballs and earth stars are all called gastroid mushrooms. If you think about your gastrointestinal system and your stomach, it means that they're producing their spores inside of themselves. So all of their spores are produced in the inside. Probably most of you have found puffballs in the fall and puffed them and it looks like smoke is coming out of them. That's actually their, their spores um, and they're reliant on things like animals stepping on them to distribute their spores. These are reliant on raindrops. I have um, time-lapse video of raindrops hitting these and as the rain hits it, the spores produce, they puff out of the mushrooms. This is the most rare mushroom I found. There are only, I think, five accounts of this particular species on iNaturalist in the whole um, New England area of the United States. And we saw this one a little bit earlier. This is the second rarest mushroom I found. I've only found it twice. In the um, United States, this is a woodland species, so it grows in the woods under trees. In Europe, it's actually grassland species. Same mushroom, different habitat. And it's on the endangered species list in a lot of countries in Europe because of habitat loss. So because they typically grow on grasslands, um, a lot of farming is gone out of practice, and so they're just losing that type of habitat. Um, Reishi mushrooms, uh, this is our northeastern United States version. It grows specifically on hemlock trees. And the split gill. So the split gill um, has 28,000 different mating types. So whereas, you know, typically we think of male and female, they have a whole slew of different possibilities, which enables them to um, mate with almost every other split gill organism they come across in the woods. So they have a very high rate of success. And they're actually found on every continent um, on the planet except for Antarctica, just because there's not enough wood for them to survive on. And actually, I think I'm going to stop there so that we have a few minutes for questions. I think we have about 10 minutes. So if anybody has any questions or thoughts. Yes. Sure. Um, you pointed out the, um, at the very end two mushrooms that were unusual for you to find, pretty rare. Yeah. When you go out and you just see such a great variety and so many, um, do you ever find mushrooms that you haven't seen before, or do you know a lot of them now and it's not as likely that you will? So, um, I'm familiar with a lot of the mushrooms, but honestly, I find new ones all the time. I was out recently and I found one that was new to me that I've never seen before. So it does happen. And sometimes I'll go out specifically looking for something that I know we have here that I haven't found. 
So I'll go to a particular place. I use iNaturalist sometimes in reverse where uh, I use their map and I'll look up a species and then I find where other people have been seeing it and then what timing they're finding it and I'll go to that place to try to find it. I do, I catalog fungi for the state. So um, I'm on a scientific advisory group for fungi to the Endangered Species Committee and we're working on a state list of fungi for Vermont because there isn't one at this point. So I do a lot of surveys where I go out and I look specifically for different species. Can you give us, an, sorry I have a follow up, um, can you give us an idea of um, how many different um, mushrooms, like if you're cataloging, what kind of numbers are we talking? I know, like I, used, I um, have looked at different wildflowers in the upper valley and over six years or so I found 250 different kinds on my own, mm -hmm. just randomly, um, but I know that there are so many 600 yeah. um, in the area. I've probably personally found about 600 and it conceivably there are at least twice that. It's thought that humans have discovered about 5 to 10 percent of the species of fungi on the planet so far. Mm -hmm. Yes? Would you, uh, is pipe considered a mushroom? No, that's a really great question. So that's actually a plant that doesn't produce its own chlorophyll, but it has a special relationship with fungi. Some parasitic plants attach directly to their plant host, but the um, ghost pipe actually taps into the mycelium of fungus that is connected to the trees. So I call it stealing cable. Basically, instead of getting its nutrient directly from the trees, it's getting it via that mycelial network. Ghost pipe. Yep. Yes. What happened to the family that ate the jack of lantern? Uh, she didn't get really into the details, but I've read. They lived. They, did, they lived, yes, but I think they had some um, unpleasant bathroom time. Yeah, afterwards. <laughs> it's They cause really intense gastrointestinal upset, so vomiting, stomach cramps, diarrhea, things that you definitely don't want. So you want to make sure you know what you're eating before you eat it. Yes? Is there a uh, specific field guide that you use or would recommend? There's one that's called um, Mushrooms of the Northeast, I, call, I think. And it are you in um, New England or Vermont? Yeah, so if you're in the area, I would definitely start with a field guide that's specific to your area and then go more general um, after that because if when you're first learning about identifying mushrooms and you can narrow it down to begin with, so you're looking at a book of species you know only grow in your area, it'll cut down on a lot of um, sort of legwork for you and trying to, say, use a general... Um, field guide that has species from all over the United States. There seems to be a divide line a lot of the time between east of the Rocky Mountains and west of the Rocky Mountains. A lot of species that look very similar but might be a different complex, species complex to the west. So start with something that's really local. And you can probably get it at the Yankee Bookshop. A plug for the Yankee Bookshop. Yes? Does this tree have to be Already starting to die for a mushroom grow on it? Um, no, there are some mushrooms that are parasitic on trees. So, birch, white birch are very susceptible to fungal disease. Um, sometimes fungi are spread by things like woodpeckers. Um, so, there might be fungal spores or fungal material on a woodpecker's bill, and it goes and starts to make a hole in another tree. And as soon as that bark is breached, if there's something already going on with that tree, typically a healthy tree won't have a fungal problem. Um, it might be already compromi compromised by weather, insects, or an injury. Um, it's more susceptible to an infection, but there are definitely some mushroom species that are, are parasitic. Yeah, yes? Your photographs are incredibly beautiful. Thank Can you. you. Share with us the attachment that you need? Yeah, so, um, I don't think I have, I mean, I can do it after this, or if you want to meet up at the book signing tent, I'll be there at 1230 and I'm happy to, you know, you can take a picture of the brand or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Do you have a website? 
Um, I have an Instagram account. It's uh, Meg Madden Design, and I share my photographs and a lot of information about mushroom species in the area. And it's also a good way to keep up with my um, event schedule. Yes. Do you have recommendations in your book, like for a beginning forager, like what species are easier to find or look for, and how to do it properly? Um, the book doesn't cut. It has a little bit of a section on foraging, but it's more of um, an informational book. I don't do a lot specifically on foraging. I'm more of a generalist and educator about the diversity that we have here, but. Um, I always recommend to people to take a foraging class or go out with someone who knows foraging. It's definitely the easiest way to learn it because it's not only about learning what a mushroom looks like and is it edible, but what environment it grows in because you really oftentimes need to know about the trees and the plants and the habitat that they're growing in as well. And, and uh, learning it firsthand is definitely the best way to go. Um, I was terrified of eating any mushrooms when I first started out because I, like many people, especially in the United States, grew up mycophobic because my mother didn't want me to die because she did not know what was edible. It's not really a big part of American culture to forage. There are some parts of the world where people, you know, they're walking home from work and they're mushrooms and they have their mushroom basket and they just become part of their meal. Um, so because I was not taught that, I was not comfortable with it. So it took me a couple of years. I think it was finally chanterelles. And I knew what they were and I knew they were edible, but I, it took me a while to break down that barrier of um, that phobia that I had grown up with, really. And I ate a teeny tiny little piece. I cooked it and I ate it and I went to bed and I woke up the next day and I said, well, I didn't die. Even though I knew what it was, I just had, it was so deep seated in me. So I do forage. I don't forage a lot. I forage the things I know. There are people who make it their mission to try to eat as many mushrooms as possible, even if they have to prepare them in a special way to detoxify them. And I'm just not in that. I'm not in it for that. So if I find edible things while I'm out, um, I will forage some things. Do we have time for another question? Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. What do you recommend for sustainable foraging? Like how much to take of what? That's a really good question too. Yeah. So um, the first thing I talk about with foraging is know what you're foraging. Be at least 100% sure. Eat a small portion. Cook it well. You shouldn't eat raw mitochondria. Um, they're made with out of chitin, which is basically what insect exoskeletons are made out of, and it's really hard for us to digest. Try a little bit. Even the mushrooms that are considered widely edible are not all digestible to everyone. And then see if it sits well with you. Um, be aware of your environment. Don't trample the plants around you. Try to... Um, you know, be aware of soil compaction and that sort of thing. It's not such a problem here, but in the West where people are commercial foraging, you know, they can really devastate the other organisms in the area. And then um, technically it's like picking fruit off a tree. So if you were to clear pick an apple tree, it doesn't hurt the organism to pick all the apples off it. It doesn't hurt the organism to say, harvest all the chanterelles, that organism will persist and it's fine, but it will not allow it to spread spores to another area. So, um, you know, you could go uh, harvest two thirds, leave a third. It depends on the species and it depends on how many you find, but I always do leave some behind, especially, you know, if they're sort of gone by or they're not ideal, I leave those. And honestly, a lot of what you leave behind is going to be ingested by slugs and insects anyway. Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs>